In the next section, we are going to look at green computing and then we're going to move over to software and have a general discussion about what is software and the different types. Now, green computing can be referred to as a program that is concerned with efficient and environmentally responsible design, manufacture, operation and disposal of IS related products. Now, what we do tend to find more and more is because people only use devices for a certain period, we do have large amounts of equipment being thrown away. We find them on garbage dumps and it is causing a lot of damage to the environment. So what do we do with our old devices which contains batteries and gases and components that might be harmful? So do we have programs in place to look at these? So there's three goals that were set out in order for green computing. The number one goal was to reduce the use of hazardous materials. So you would find that companies nowadays commit themselves to manufacture products that once disregarded won't cause a lot of negative damage to the environment. The second goal was to enable them to create devices that requires less power so it's more cost or power efficient again because our power needs will relate back to greenhouse gases um, requiring electricity all those kind of things and then the last one was the safe disposal or recycling of computers and compu computer equipment every year so instead of just throwing it away you would typically take it to a recycle center and they would get rid of the device in a more efficient manner, trying to reuse um, some of the components, the metals that they can melt, all those kind of things. Now, connected with green computing, we find what is known as the EPEAT tool. Now, this stands for the Electronic Product Environmental Assessment Tool. Now, this is a system that enables purchasers to go and evaluate and compare products and to compare companies to one another in order to make sure that they are actually responsible and that they adhere to the green computing requirements. So you would find that they would need to be, or products would need to be categorized into three tiers, either as bronze, silver and gold, that they meet all the criteria and that optional criteria are also looked at. So the better your rating, the more companies would generally tend to do business with you. And this has actually become a new strategy for various companies. We do find that nowadays when buildings are designed that they tend to try and opt to go for your greener buildings, which has solar, pa solar panels that requires less en energy or more cost effective, efficient and all those other aspects. Now let's go on and talk about software. So what is software? Software can be defined as a computer program which relates to a sequence of instructions that the computer need to ac execute in order to achieve a specific goal. So if you think back to the section about hardware, we said that we're going to work with a machine cycle which will execute instructions. And the program also works on that principle where it's actually a combination of hundreds of thousands of instructions that would enable you to achieve a specific goal. Now, whenever you have programs or applications, you generally need to have documentation that go with them. And this documentation should describe the functionality of that program. If you look on the right hand side, there's a small subset of a program. So you see the set of instructions and whatever you see in green, these are just some comments that was made in order to allow other people that would need to come and change this particular application to know what was done and to enable them to go and make the changes. Now, you might have heard about EULA or End User License Agreements. Now, typically these are the agreements that once you install an application, it tells you that you need to read through the list of agreements, which most people just skip by and say yes, yes, yes. But these agreements actually tell you 
what you are allowed to do and not do with the program, what kind of information they can gather for you, and then what your rights as a user typically is. For example, I, I'm going to presume that many of you listening to these videos might subscribe to Gmail, um, Google Drive, Dropbox. Do you know that by using those services and by agreeing to the services, you are actually indirectly giving them permission to use whatever information you are putting on Dropbox and let's say Google Drive. So if you got photographs and they want to use your photographs, you have given them the right to actually go and do so. So please be careful whenever you agree to the end user license agreement statement that you make sure that you familiarize yourself with the content and if you're not happy with that, that you don't agree to that and perhaps look for an, another program. Now when we talk about software, we typically find two types, system software and application software. Now system software is a program that is designed to coordinate activities and functions of the hardware and the various programs on your computer. So remember up to this stage we've spoken about hardware. So system software would, in, would allow you to interact with your hardware. So if you press a key on the keyboard, it's going to send that command to your CPU through the motherboard. That will be executed and that's going to be displayed when, in whichever program you're busy working with. The second type that we find is application software. Now these are programs that are created in such a manner that it supports specific goals. For example, if you think about your cell phone, you have the ability to go and install various applications. So those would be considered application software. You can decide that you want to put on games, that you want to put on word processing applications, email applications, etc. Now, application software resides on a computer's hard disk, and these can typically be installed from CDs, DVDs, and USB flash drives. So what we do find is that you would have gone to a company like, let's say for argument's sake, Incredible Connection, you would have bought the application, get a box, get the CDs, you get the necessary documentation, you would have taken it home, inserted it into your computer, and then you would have started the installation process. What we do see now more frequently as well is that a lot of these applications are conducted through the internet. So you don't need to have a physical CD or DVD in order to install it. Another concept that we're also going to find more frequently is known as RIA or Rich Internet Applications. Now these are applications that's available on the web. So previously where you were required to install an application to your hard disk. Now they give you the ability to work with the application, but the application is actually contained on a website. So you access it through your web browser. So there's no need to go and install it. It's important to realize that before you buy software, that you need to go and look at your business goals and needs. Because all of this actually comes down to license agreements, which indirectly relates to money and can be huge, um, huge costs associated to your company. So make sure that what you want to buy, you can afford that and that it's actually required and needed. Otherwise, you're going to waste your resources. Now, software can be divided into various groups, and this is generally referred to as the spheres of influence. Now, the spheres of influence indicates the scope of problems and opportunities that can be addressed within different segments of your organization or in an individual's life. Now, spheres of influence can be categorized as either personal, individual users, work groups, people working to achieve the same goal, or enterprise types. And this is where we need to solve the for argument's sake, the, problem, the problems or the requirements of an organization. Now we can take each one of the categories that we've mentioned before, system software and application software, and we can go and indicate the requirements for each one of these spheres that we've now mentioned. For example, if we talk about system software, 
the software required to operate the hardware capabilities of your device. On a personal level, it's typically your smartphone, tablet, personal computer and workstation operating systems. In a workgroup environment, it would contain your network operating systems. And then on an enterprise level, it would be your server and mainframe operating systems. On the application side, for individuals, we find typically your word processing, spreadsheet, database, graphics, games, all those types of applications. For work groups where people need to collaborate and work together, we find applications such as email, group scheduling, um, shared work, for example, where you've got calendars and you need to make appointments, those kind of things, as well as systems that will enable collaboration. On the enterprise side, it would include, for example, systems such as your general ledger, order entry, payroll and HR systems. Please take note that for each one of these systems, especially the application systems, there might be others that's not mentioned here. Now let's talk a little about installing and removing software. Before you can work with any software, you need to install it on a particular device and the same applies to your mobile phones. So you would generally go either insert a CD or you would go to a application store and you would select the product that you want to install and the installation process would be started. It's going to ask you a few steps. Typically, where should it be saved? Do you want to make changes to what should be saved for the, that particular application? And it's going to take you through the whole process. And we generally talk about the installation wizard. If you find that you no longer use a particular program, you also have the ability to go and uninstall that program. And this is a good practice that you can apply that once you realize that you don't need a particular program for a certain task, that you go and uninstall it because it will actually go and open up some of your storage resources. And then by uninstalling it, again, software will aid you in that process. And it's going to make sure that all the elements of that unwanted storage, unwanted software will be removed. Now let's go and look at system software and application software in more details. System software controls the operations of your computer hardware. It also supports your application programs in order to allow you to perform certain tasks. Now there's different types. We find operating systems, utility programs and middleware. And the next section we'll talk about these. Now as we say the operating the operating software, the many times referred to as the OS of your computer, and these include examples such as Windows, um, iOS, etc. Now these can be defined as a set of programs that control the computer hardware and acts as an interface between applications. So if you look at the picture at the bottom here, we've got our hardware. Installed on the hardware, we need the operating system, let's say for argument's sake, Windows. Windows would enable applications to communicate with the hardware, and then the person would communicate through the application. So there's a whole flow of information that would continuously take place. So you've got your operating system connected to your hardware, and your application connected to your users. And all the subsequent interaction takes place between the operating system and the applications. Now, when we talk about operating systems, again, it's important to realize that we get various combinations. And these can depend on the types of computers that you have, as well as the amount or the number of people connected to these systems. So whenever you go and buy systems, you need to think about the following aspects. Some license agreements would specify that you can use an operating system or an application on a single computer for a single user. And these we typically find on your personal computers, your tablets, smartphones, or handheld computers. Then we might have single computer environments where multiple people access those computers. And these are typically located in larger firms where there's mainframe computers which can accommodate thousands of individuals. For example, if you work in a company, 
it might be required that you guys share computers. If you go to library, there's five computers, but hundreds of people share those computers throughout the day. Then the third option that we have is multiple computers with multiple users. These are typically network computers, such as your home networks. And we again, you have computers connected to um, larger computer networks, hundreds of users. And licensing would permit you to install it on, let's say, 10 devices with unlimited user access. The last category that we do find is known as your special purpose computers. And these are computers with very specialized functions. Now, typical examples include those for military aircraft, space shuttles, etc. But more locally, perhaps a more obvious example, if you go to an ATM machine, that machine has specific software installed on it in order for you to work with that ATM machine. If you think in terms of motor vehicles, the newer cars, these cars contain software where you can control the system settings and the functionality of your vehicle. Now, talking about the operating system, we need to talk about the process of starting your computer. Now, this is also known as booting up your computer. So when you start your computer, we said that on your computer, you have RAM and ROM, your random access memory, as well as your read-only memory. Now, we said before that for read-only memory, certain instructions will be executed, one of them being loading the operating system. So when you boot up your computer, it's going to try to locate the operating system. It's going to load the required files, which would in, in return load the, the basic requirements for the operating system and then enable you, you to start interact with that operating system. What we also find is a concept known as a rescue disk. So many times when people install an operating system, it will ask them to create a rescue disk. So if something happens and you delete some of the important operating system files and your computer doesn't want to function, you can just go put in your rescue disk it would have the basic required files and it will enable you to go into your computer in safe mode in order to fix whatever issues could be detected in your operating system. Now operating systems contains a collection of programs that aid the running of your hardware and perhaps your software. Now again these are more technical but we're going to look at these so if you're not interested in this, you can just skip this particular section. So some of the programs that we're going to encounter would control your common hardware functions. It would be your user interface, your input and output management. Number three, your hardware independence. Number four, memory management. Number five, processing tasks. Number six, networking capabilities. Number seven, accessing your system resources and security access control. And then number eight, file management. So let's simplify this by looking at each one in a little more detail. So number one, the common hardware functions. This will enable that all the hardware that are connected to the computer can communicate to each other. So for example, if you want to get the input from a keyboard or any other input device, it's going to handle that on your behalf. Retrieving information from disks, storing information on disks, and then displaying information on a monitor or, for example, printing information in either printed format or by creating a 3D object. So all of these elements would be handled by the hardware functions. The next one that users typically access more frequently, your user interface as well as your input-output management. Now, we need to start to refer to a few terms again. So the first one is, what is a user interface? These are the elements of the operating system that allows you to access and to command the operating system. So this is your portal to the actual system. So typically you would find pictures on it and I'm going to show you examples shortly where you can go and click on icons and that would perhaps open applications. Another definition that we need to talk about is your command based user interface. Now these were typically your older interfaces where we didn't have the screen capabilities in order to display graphics where you had to go and physically 
type in commands in order to access files and to upload and download files. So the interface required you to give text commands to the computer in order to perform basic activities. That was replaced by graphic user interfaces or the GUI. Now these types of interfaces displays pictures also known as icons and menus that people typically access in order to issue commands to the computer system. Now there are also some other interfaces that we need to refer to. For example, previously we've mentioned natural user interfaces or multi-touch user interfaces. And these are interfaces where you are aided by additional tools such as touch screens, where you can speak um, perhaps to the device. The device would recognize what you're trying to say through natural language processing and your commands would be executed. Or where on cell phones nowadays you can just swipe above the screen and it recognizes that as a particular action. We also have site interfaces. Now for site interfaces is typically where you've got a camera. So you look at the camera, you do a movement, the camera recognizes that movement and it goes and it performs a specific action. Again, if we refer back to our input devices where we talked, to, talked about Microsoft Connect. So you would stand in front of your TV and all your movements would be recorded by that gaming system. Another type that we find is your brain computer interfaces, BCI, where you've got a device that you put on your, your head and it actually goes and detects your brain waves and allows you to control your computer through thought. So let's look at some of these different interfaces. The first example is a command based interface. So this is what we experienced a few years ago. So whenever you wanted to work on the device, you had to actually go and type in physical instructions in order to operate that machine. Very difficult to work with because you needed to understand that language. You needed to know what commands to type in and what um, settings to go and set for each of these commands. That was replaced by your more graphical user interfaces. So this is an example of a Windows interface, in this case Windows 7. So you would have a menu structure. So if you go and click on the start icon, it would pop up this menu structure, which would allow you to go and access various applications in order to enable you to work on the computer. Also, this would have been referred to as your desktop. And on your desktop, you would have found various icons which once clicked on would open applications. The next version was Windows 8, Windows 8.1. Now this one wasn't that popular. Many people found it difficult to use because it was a drastic change from the ordinary graphic user interface into this new panel based interface. So this lasted for a few years and it was actually replaced by Windows 10, which is the one that we currently see on a lot of computers, where they've pretty much brought back the menu-based structure, the start button, but they also allowed the panels that was introduced in Windows 8 and 8.1 to also be present. So this is what we currently see and work with. The following example is what we find on our Mac computing systems, your Apple computers. So similar principle. You've got a Windows environment, you've got a desktop, you've got a set of icons which would represent your applications that you can go and access. Now let's look at the third one, hardware independence. Hardware independence relates to linking our applications to the operating system and then to the actual hardware. Now in order to do that, we said that we needed a connection between the operating system and the application and that connection would be established through a concept known as API. Um, please apologies for that missing content there. So the API is specific instructions that a programmer would build into an application in order to ensure that that application communicate with the operating system and then subsequently with all the hardware components. The fourth task of operating system is known as memory management. So now we go back to our processor and our RAM and ROM. 
Now, this section would control how memory is accessed and how memory is used for working with data and then ultimately for storing information. It's going to allow the computer to execute program instructions effectively and it's going to be done in such a manner that the computer can become more efficient by incorporating stuff such as multi-processing and your multi-processors which again we've spoken about in our hardware. You might have heard that in many operating systems they talk about a concept known as virtual memory. So for argument's sake you've got RAM on your computer which has limited capabilities so you can only put in so much data within your RAM. So the operating system can actually go and create temporary pages known as pages on your physical storage devices, your secondary storage. So whenever it needs to save information that it doesn't require immediately, it can put it on the hard disk and then once required, when space becomes available in your RAM, it can retrieve it from the hard disk and put it back into RAM. And that is generally known as paging. Now the fifth process that we're going to refer to is known as your processing tasks. And this would enable your computer to function in a more efficient manner by executing multiple tasks at the same time. So with task management, we will see that nowadays we can have multiple applications open and you can easily jump between applications and send information between applications. So this allows people to run the programs at the same time and even for people to share computers at the same time. So we can find this in especially home environments where you can log in, you do your work, you log out and somebody else perform the activities. Once they're done, you go back, you log in and it knows where you've ended off. So your information wouldn't be disregarded. A few concepts that we need to talk about here. Multi-user. Now this is where we find two or more users that runs computers at the same time on a computer. So if you want to share resources. Multi-processing, where a program can be run on multiple CPUs, and we've mentioned this as part of our processing hardware capabilities. Multitasking, where more than one program can be run at the same time, so the processor wouldn't be restricted to one program. It's going to give equal time slots available to the amount of programs open on your system. We've got multi-threading which would allow different threads or sets of instructions to be run independently. So again, a single program can be broken into different components and these can be handled independently. And then they also talk about real-time processing, which relates to immediately responses to your processing. Number six is networking ca capability, and we're going to do this in a later topic discussion. So with network capability, it's going to allow your computer to communicate with other computers or other systems on other networks or around the world. So it will allow you to send and receive data and computing resources to multiple users. Number seven, working with access to system resources and security. Now here we're going to try to provide a high level of security and prevent unauthorized users from accessing our resources. Now this was typically achieved by using a login procedure and this is what we see on the right here. So once your operating system was installed, you would have created a user account, you would have assigned a password to that account and then every time when you want to work on the computer, it's going to ask you to enter your password. The system would typically track who's using the computer, what is the length of use, were there any security breaches, and then if those things happen, it would log it so that later on you can actually go and detect that. Now there's various methods available to go and access a computer, of which passwords was the number one method. We do find that there's a new method being introduced again by Windows, where you can put a photograph on screen as part of your password, and then you would need to go and perform a specific action in order to get that recognized as your password. The only problem with this is if you're in an environment where people are around you, 
they would see your password and then they can go and log in on your behalf. So it wasn't that secure and that popular. Others that we see, the swiping of a pattern, which a lot of people use on their cell phones. And again, the idea is that only the person using that device knows the pattern. But then again, if somebody sees that, they can go and open your device on your behalf. Another more popular one is where we've got fingerprint scanning. We do find this on some of the newer smartphones. So you would touch your finger on a specific location on the device and then it would go and open the device. Two additional ones that we haven't included on the slides are retina scanning, where you look at your mobile phone, it looks at your iris, determines the patterns and those are unique and then it will grant you access. And then the last one is where you go and it recognizes your face and then based on your face characteristics it would open up the information or the content. Number eight, the file management section of operating system. Now this is where whenever you work on your computer and you start saving files, installing software, where it manages that particular files and software. So you would find that you've got a file management software that would, that would track where files are being located, the size that those files are, who created them, when they were created, etc. So if you look at the example at the bottom here, this is where we've got Windows Explorer. You can go into a specific folder and it's going to show you the files within that folder. It will also show you the date it was modified and created, the type of file, the size, and you can actually go and set up some extra attributes that it needs to go and display and show to you. The next section talks about some of the more popular operating systems. Now we're just going to look at a few of the smaller ones or not more, more of the well-known ones. So at this stage, I'm not going to go into detail talking about the personal, the work group and the enterprise software. That is perhaps a little more technical where your information systems and your IT people would be able to assist you. But if we think in terms of some of the software that we do find, as mentioned, we find Microsoft Windows. Now, Microsoft Windows, as you know, was developed by Bill Gates. It originated from PC-DOS, which was a command-based interface, and that evolved into a graphical user interface, and currently we're seeing Windows 10. Now, the whole idea was with each subsequent version that it became easier. It made your processing more reliable, not, so not more reliable, more efficient, and it actually gave you an environment that was more reliable. It supported new hardware, and generally you find that most companies and users typically nowadays work with the Windows operating system. Some other examples that we find, on Apple computers you get OS X, now the latest version um, at this stage was about 10.9, if I'm not mistaken I think it goes up to 12 now. Um, it do allow people to create bull, dual boot systems where you can either go and run Windows or Mac, Mac OS. Another example that we find, and this is um, in most cases it, it originated from Unix systems where we've got Linux. Now this is an open source system where typically it's provided for free and you can go and customize and release your own versions of it. And then some of the open source versions that we do find is known as Red Hat, SUSE, as well as Canonical. If we go and talk about our cell phone devices, we would find that we generally see stuff like your Google operating systems, Android, and then typically they would be based on Linux systems, and then they go and they use various project names in order to go and give version numbers to these systems. For example, if we think of in terms of your cell phones, you might have heard about um, gingerbread, jelly bean, ice cream sandwich, lollipop, marshmallow, etc. So these are just the various versions that they've created. Um, now, giving you a little background on Google, they started off as a search engine, so google.com, and they've actually expanded to create their own applications, 
um, to create their own operating systems and they nowadays even create robotics in their own cell phones. Now Chrome OS is also available which is again based on Linux and this is designed for netbooks and net tops also developed by Google and it would provide you with a more inexpensive lower powering lower power requiring computer environment and then they provide you an open source version of Chrome OS which is known as Chromium in the next section we see some of Windows the, the timeline of the Windows operating systems and this is where we would find that a system would last for a certain period so just for interest sake at this stage we would find that support has actually been um, ended for w Windows Vista and Windows XP so no longer will Microsoft assist you with any issues that you have because they expect you to install the newer versions such as Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10 you would find that if you go on the internet that um, the older versions you would see that there's going to be less use for that the later versions would gain more popularity etc talking about cell phone usage I'm going to show you guys some statistics perhaps where if you look at Android you would see that it has a tremendous growth from about 2012 2013 whereas other operating systems are declining so for example if we look at Windows 7 that has been replaced by Windows 8 and Windows 10 so it's starting to die down you would find that something like um, Symbian and it's not indicated here which is perhaps that blue one where Symbian was the operating system that we found on Nokia devices where that has been become outdated and people has, have basically stopped to use these kind of devices the next thing that we need to talk about is the operating system that we typically find on embedded devices or that's embedded on devices now this will be contained on smaller computers embedded computers and special purpose devices for example the ones that we find on our TV cable boxes such as your explorers and your DSTV top TV boxes on cell phones the digital watches we see smart watches nowadays your new digital cameras mp3 players calculators microwave ovens and the list goes on so an embedded operating system is contained on that particular device it includes a processor that's implanted and embedded on it and that's dedicated to the processing capabilities of that particular device some of the popular types that we find Windows embedded we also find some proprietary ones such as Linux now these we typically find on the Sony Wii's gaming consoles ebook readers your ATM machines etc we find Windows embedded so these can be contained in your smaller devices as we've mentioned before your TV set-top boxes, your ATM machines, automated industrial machines, etc. And then we've got our proprietary Linux-based systems there that we have that's provided for free. It's highly configurable and you can actually go and customize it and use, your, use it in your own environment. Coming back to the operating systems that we typically find on our mobile devices, again, as it was mentioned before, Android has gained a lot of popularity due to the fact that it was installed on the Samsung flagship devices and we would find that Symbian indicated a decline because Nokia um, didn't incorporate newer technologies, newer graphical user interfaces and they actually lost a lot of customers due to that now for the next section we're going to talk about utility programs and middleware now a utility program is a program that assists you with the maintenance of your computer system so typically if you need to scan for viruses or if you need to make backups 
Um, some of you guys might have heard about defragmentation, where if your computer becomes very slow, you can actually go and reorganize the files on your computer system. Now, there's various of these examples available. Another concept that we would find is known as middleware. Now, middleware would allow you to connect different systems to each other to exchange information and to communicate with each other. Now, let's look at utility programs and where, if, where it fits within the spheres of influence. On a personal level, we find that individuals tend to use it to compress files, they use it to delete and copy files as well as for your antivirus, anti-spyware software. For work groups, remember these are people in groups of two or three or more, where we need to maintain an archive of shared documents, where it should go and monitor group activity as well as participation, and where we need to keep track of, let's say for argument's sake, unsuccessful login attempts. On an enterprise level, where we need to archive the contents in our database by either copying it to backup devices such as your magnetic tapes or your virtual tapes or your SAN devices, where we need to monitor network traffic and server loads, as well as where we need to report the status of particular computer jobs. Now for middleware, we said that it's going to allow different systems to communicate with each other and to exchange information. So in many cases we find that it provides an interface between the internet and various corporate systems. Now there's a concept associated with this known as Service Oriented Architecture or SOA, which is a software design approach that uses modules with specific functions and these enable services and applications to talk to each other. We're going to stop this discussion at this stage. The next discussion would continue and talk about application software.